introduce you today. So I will introduce myself. I'm Marguerite Boulay, and I'm going to be talking for the next few minutes about Roberto Devro, which is um, an opera that most of us are not very, very familiar with. So this is going to be really a lot of fun today. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'll get right to it. Uh, the full title, Roberto Devereux, Ossia il Conte di Essex, or the Earl of Essex. That's all that means. It's a tragic opera by Gaetano Donizetti, loosely based, very loosely based on the life of Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, who was a very influential member of the court of Queen Elizabeth, that is, until he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Donizetti himself was very, very fascinated with Elizabethan history. He wrote three operas featuring Queen Elizabeth in a starring role, and in all three he gave very dramatic life to the rumors that actually were spreading back in the 1500s that the Virgin Queen actually had kind of a secret and passionate love life. <laughs> and uh, and it, it does appear that Queen Elizabeth did have a lifelong weakness for good-looking, fawning young men. So, in his Nothing first... wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> in his first two Elizabethan operas, Elizabeth at Kenilworth Castle and Maria Stuarda, the Queen is romantically linked with Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester. But now in Roberto Devereux, Donizetti's final opera about Elizabeth, she's involved with the Earl of Essex. Now we do know that when she was in her 60s, she was obsessed with the handsome Robert Devereux. And it was said that she loved his eloquence, his intelligence, uh, his skill at courtly love. But actually, outsiders of the time kind of wondered what the fuss was about. They sort of saw him as this kind of slimy playboy, and they really didn't get what she saw in him. Well, we do. Um, but Tony Setti's opera catch really captures this dynamic. He does liven up the story considerably. Um, in the opera, uh, Robert is eventually beheaded, and that is historically accurate. But Donizetti's Elizabeth signs the death warrant, not because he was responsible for a treasonous rebellion, but because he had the nerve to fall for another woman. She does this in a jealous fury. Now, Robert Devereux was the last person to be executed at the Tower of London. Um, and then Queen Elizabeth died not too long afterwards, and King James I ascended the English throne. But it was said an eyewitness, a supposed eyewitness, said about the queen, her delight is to sit in the dark, sometimes shedding tears to bewail Essex. So there were a few French plays about this subject in the early 19th century. Salvatore Camarano wrote the, the Italian libretto for this particular opera, mainly derived from another libretto by Felice Romani, uh, from 1833. In fact, Romani's widow charged Camerano with plagiarism, but the reality was that this was Italy, and the practice of stealing plots was so common, I mean, nothing even, <laughs> no, nobody thought anything. Okay, so Donizetti now. He was born in 1797 in Bergamo, in Lombardy region. Uh, he didn't come from a musical background, but there was a local composer, Simon Mayer, who founded his own conservatory, and he gave Donizetti a full scholarship to study composition. Uh, Mayer also obtained a place for Donizetti at the Bologna Academy, where at the age of 19, he wrote his first one-act opera, the comedy Il Pigmalione, Pigmalion, particularly noteworthy because it was never actually performed until 1960 uh, in his hometown in Bergamo. That was the first time anybody really heard it. So along with Rossini and Bellini, Donizetti was a leading composer of the bel canto opera style during the first half of the 19th century. I do want to talk a little bit about bel canto style because this is very, very important when really listening to this. Um, so it's a singer-dominated manner of composition, sometimes improvisation. And it really played to the audience's delight in vocal agility, smoothness of voice, 
very long, florid melodies. It's the virtuosity of the performer that's the main consideration of any opera composition, more so even than the story. It is singer-driven. That's important to know. There were particular forms, which we are going to be listening to soon, mostly relying on the device of the cavatina and the cabaletta. Within these forms and their expectations, those are the outlines where the composer and the artists can show their originality. But they are in these forms. So part of the enjoyment of an opera such as Roberto Devereux lies in an appreciation of this dynamic. So the cavatina is slow and lyric. It shows off a singer's line, a singer's control. It demonstrates the singer's ability to hold a long phrase with beauty of tone, with color, with nuance. The cabaletta, that's where the fireworks take place. And a singer was expected to have flawless technique, um, as well as taste in ornaments, in any embellishments. This combination of pure tone and brilliant technique, that constitutes bel canto singing. And much of this kind of singing descended from the castrati. And there was one castrato virtuoso, Baldassari Ferri, from the 17th century. And he could insert consecutive trills for two octaves, up and down, in one breath. And it took about 50 seconds to do. Yeah. Over the course of his career, Donizetti wrote about 70 operas, 51 of them while in residency in Naples at the Teatro di San Carlo. His residency began in 1822, which would make him about 25 years old when he began. So remember, during this time in Italy, a composer would usually arrive at an opera house, compose an opera in three weeks or so, conduct the first few performances, and then move on to the next town. This was just kind of the standard thing. It was a business, and the faster the turnover, the better. Felix Mendelssohn traveled in Italy, and he was not amused at the Italian method of composition. And in fact, he observed Donizetti and wrote, I'm quoting now, Donizetti finishes an opera in 10 days. It may be hissed, to be sure, but that doesn't matter, as it is paid for all the same, and then he can go about having a good time. Sometimes he spends as much as three weeks on an opera, taking considerable pains with a couple of arias in it, so that they may please the public, and then he can afford to amuse himself once more and once more write trash. <laughs> <laughs> the Italians were not up to Mendelssohn's work ethic. But what was happening in Naples, it's just important to know that this was the scene of many innovations in opera seria form, serious opera form. The opera-going audience was pretty sophisticated, and they were open to experiments in musical and dramatic forms that maybe if they tried doing this in other places would not really go over so well and wouldn't really be understood. Be um, excuse me. Before 1830, Donizetti's main success was with his comic operas. The serious ones didn't really attract significant audiences. <coughs> However, in 1830, Anna Bolena was premiered, and that's when Donizetti finally made a major impact on the Italian and the international opera scene. So in the spring of 1837, Donizetti finalized a contract for a new opera seria for the Teatro San Carlo. Now this happened to be a period of tremendous crisis and grief for him. The year before, he lost both his parents. A child had been stillborn. That year, in 1837, uh, a ch another child was stillborn, and then his wife finally passed away at the age of 28 on July 30th. The rehearsals for the premiere began at the end of August 1837. So his wife died at the end of July, so most of the score had to be written in the month following his wife's death. And additionally, a cholera epidemic delayed the start of rehearsals. So there's all of this going on um, around the composition of it. It did premiere October 29th, 1837. And it happened to appear at a time, this was kind of a perfect storm, 
Several factors came together to really ensure Donizetti's reputation as a very significant composer of opera. Rossini retired in 1829. Bellini died in 1835. And this really kind of left Donizetti as the sole reigning genius of Italian opera. In addition, there was also a lot of interest across the continent of Europe in the history and culture of Scotland and England. Uh, there was perceived romance of the wars, the feuds, folklore, mythology, and this really intrigued 19th century um, audiences. So Roberto Devereux was first performed two years after Maria Stuarta and Lucia de Lamamore, and it really shows Donizetti at the height of his musical and dramatic powers. So we deal with that, Mendelssohn. Um, <laughs> although not frequently performed today, it does contain some of Donizetti's best vocal writing. This opera is raw and emotional. It's a very powerful vehicle for the soprano. If you don't have a good singer for this, it, you, just, you just don't bother doing it. Uh, you must have a wonderful singer for it. It is not entirely historically accurate. But really, we shouldn't expect to be learning about English history from 19th century opera. <laughs> so, the opera was quite a success. It was performed in most European cities for the next few decades, including a performance in New York in 1849. However, after about 1880, there were no further performances given throughout the 19th century. In fact, the opera was not performed again until a revival of the San Carlo in Naples in 1964. Wow. Roberto Devereux was first performed by the New York City Opera in October 1970 as the first part of the Three Queens trilogy, along with Anna Bolena and Maria Stuarta. And that was be it began to be promoted as the Tudor trilogy in the 70s, um, when <coughs> Beverly Sills promoted them as a series in, in New York City Opera. Prior to this, the operas were not considered to be related. And just a little thing that what she said about singing those roles is that um, it took 10 years off her career. <laughs> They're so, so challenging. It was performed on a regular basis in European houses during the 1980s. So it's, it's a fearsome undertaking for a soprano. It's long. It encompasses a slightly larger than two octave span. There are forte passages at both ends with ensembles and alone. And just the sheer number of notes the singer has to get out is just awesome. Um, emotionally, too, the part is wrenching. Elizabeth is in love with Robert, who in turn loves Sarah. And she's a ferocious monarch. She's, she's comfortable and powerful when she's ruling. But in private, she's a shattered woman with vulnerabilities and doubts. And Donizetti has given us a very, very tragic figure in this. So now we're going to go into the opera itself and start listening to some of the pieces. So backstory now, and we're starting off. In order to prevent rumors and to protect her reputation, Queen Elizabeth had sent her lover, Roberto Devereux, on a military mission to Ireland. He had been removed from office as governor of Ireland, though, because acting on his own initiative, he had agreed to a ceasefire with the rebels. Then there was an attempted uprising. So he was accused of treason, and he was waiting for that in London. Now, this did happen in real life. However, the opera expands the story. The queen is still madly in love with him, but he's in love with Sarah. Sarah was married off to the Duke of Nottingham while Devereux was away. Oh, yes, Nottingham is his best friend. <laughs> and Nottingham doesn't know about Devereux and Sarah's romance. All right, so this is, this is the scene. We come into kind of in the middle of things in all this. So um, I wanted to play this little opening for you because it also has a few iterations of God Save the Queen. I just thought this was kind of interesting. Also notice they're going to be, you know, kind of some drum rolls or da da that kind of thing. Usually that was just to get the audience to sit down and be quiet. You know, that was, okay, it's starting now. Um, so. oh, don't want that. Yeah. He's reading it.
look at the tone that's being set just from the very beginning. Very solemn. traditional type of overture. All right. So, London, 1601, at the Palace of Westminster in the Great Hall, Sarah, the Duchess of Nottingham, is in tears while she's reading a book about Rosamunda, or Rosamund. Um, Rosamund was the unfortunate lover of Henry II. Things did not end well for her. So, uh, so Sarah's in love with Robert Devereux, her husband's closest friend. The ladies of the court are concerned, but she replies that she's happy while privately revealing her sadness. And she sings, uh, to one who is sad, weeping is sweet. Very Italian. <laughs> says that she's going to follow Nottingham's advice and has agreed to see Robert once again now that he has returned from Ireland accused of treason. So we're first going to be hearing a recitative and it is, recitative is basically what it says, it, reciting, okay? It's kind of half speaking, half, half uh, singing. Um, it, it doesn't really have a melody to it, but it moves things along. So this goes on for a little bit. Um, and in this, Duchess, to your husband's eager requests. going to be happening, the queen is willing to release him without charges if she can be assured of his loyalty. And to Sarah's dismay, the queen starts revealing her love for Robert. Now, these next two, I'm going to play so you can hear the form of the cavatina and the cavaletta. So these are going to be um, a little longish. They're a couple of minutes, but you really should get a sense of what these forms are about to really understand bel canto. His love was a blessing to me. Palatina.
We think this was Beverly Sills. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it's so interesting because people think um, that it takes more technique to sing things that are very fast, very fast tempo. The reality is that technique is shown in the slower things, the control. And you hear what was done in this, just incredible control of the voice. You know, when you have something with fireworks built in, you already have the rhythmic propulsion, you have that energy in there already. Something like this, you have to provide the energy. Incredible. So, this was from the opera. So, um, Lord Cecil, Lord Cecil comes in. He demands that the Queen sign Robert's death warrant. Parliament is waiting, and they're concerned she's being too lenient towards him. But she tells him she's not convinced of his disloyalty and refuses to sign the death warrant proposed by the Royal Council. Now we are going to hear Cabaletta. If love guides you, you are innocent to me. <clears throat> dismisses the court, and now alone together, Elizabeth promises Robert that the ring she once gave him will always be the pledge of his safety, should he ever return it to her. Remember this. Uh, his reaction to her talk of their past love, though, is a little cool, and she becomes suspicious. The author's main conflict is voiced in a duet, after Elizabeth comes to realize that Robert doesn't love her. And it's a revelation. She calls un lampo horrible, a horrible truth. <clears throat> starts singing, hide and check your wild beating, oh my unhappy heart. <laughs> and then they proceed into this um, duet. And this duet is really one of the highlights 
of the opera. Uh, she just keeps demanding that Robert name the woman he loves, and he just says, I don't know what you're talking about. Denies that he loves anyone. <laughs> so here's a little bit of the duet. So it's repeating. And he tries to greet Robert, and Robert kind of shrinks from his embrace. Nottingham is worried about his best friend's safety, but he's also concerned about his unhappy wife. And he finds her crying over a blue scarf that she was embroidering, you know, and he, he doesn't know what to do about that. Is this a sign of infidelity? So he first has Nottingham has this cavatina regarding Sarah, perhaps in that sensitive part. So he doesn't quite know what to do about that. Then he goes back to Robert and he says, Here, everyone calls you a traitor. <laughs> comes in, demands that Nottingham attends a meeting of the peers of the realm, which are going to decide Robert's fate. Nottingham assures Robert he's going to do everything he can to defend him. All right, scene switches now. Sarah's apartments at Nottingham House. In Nottingham's apartment, Sarah thinks of Robert and the danger he's in, and then he suddenly appears. He reproaches her for marrying Nottingham while he was away in Ireland, but she replied it was the Queen's idea, and she was forced into it. Sarah, in turn, reminds Robert that he's wearing the, queen, the Queen's ring. Remember, that was mentioned before. He tears it off and assures her of his love. He gives it to her. Not a good move. Sarah, <laughs> Sarah implores him to flee and gives him the blue shawl as a pledge of her affection. All right, this is going to come back, as you know. So we have a final duet that they finally decide they have to say goodbye forever. And so um, they sing, you know, she sings, since you returned on miserable me, and then the next example, dry, these bitter tears, and then they both sing cruel destiny, a lifetime of tears, and they just will never see each other again. So we'll just hear little snippets of this part. This is the end of Act One. <laughs> Since you returned miserable me.
next example is Roberto to Sarah, dry with those bitter tears. <laughs> Westminster in the Great Hall. The queen approaches Cecil to find out what has been decided, and Cecil says the sentence is death. The queen, asked him why the whole process took so long, learns that Robert had a blue shawl in his possession, which he resisted giving over. It is handed to her. Uh, Nottingham enters and pleads for Robert's life, but at this point now Elizabeth realizes that there is a rival for her affections. All right, so Nottingham and Elizabeth sing, Never Had I Come So Saddened. But they're talking about two different things. <laughs> Trust me, it's just I'm aware of the time, so we have to move along here. Okay. Um, Nottingham keeps insisting that Robert is innocent. But the Queen continues to describe how she knows that Robert has been unfaithful. When he's brought in, confronts him, showing the scarf. Nottingham sees it as well, recognizes it, and he is furious. And he declares he's going to have vengeance while at the same time, Elizabeth offers Robert his freedom if he reveals the name of her rival. <laughs> Here is the unworthy one, Echo Lindeño. <laughs> with these terrible realizations for Nottingham, for Elizabeth, and also for Devereux, he's realizing, uh-oh, now she knows, she knows everything. Okay, um, for example, 16, Scelerato Malvagio. All right. 
signs the death warrant, announcing that a cannon shot will be heard as the axe falls. Nottingham fumes that the axe is not a suitable punishment. He wants it worse than that. And uh, Roberto realizes he's lost everything. The enraged queen signs his death warrant. All right, act three. We're in Sarah's apartment. Alone, Sarah gets a letter from Robert. And he tells her to take the ring to Elizabeth and beg for mercy. However, before she can leave, Nottingham comes in, reads the letter. So, example 17, he talks, don't you know what betrayed husbands are like? He confronts her. <laughs> So that's enough of that. All right. <laughs> She's protesting her innocence. You know, really, nothing happened. Everything is fine. But he prevents her from leaving. They hear the funeral march for Robert as he's led to the tower. And Nottingham leaves to exact his revenge on Robert. And she faints. All right, next scene. We're in the Tower of London. And in his cell, Robert is wondering, why hasn't the queen received the ring yet? <laughs> but he still refuses to betray Sarah. And so he does sing um, about her like an angelic spirit with my breast bathed in tears. He realizes that he's facing his death. at the door of the cell, but it is not to free him. It is to take him to his execution. And as Robert is led to his execution, he reflects on his past with regret, seeing a lifetime of indiscretions. Um, yet he still hopes that Elizabeth will receive the ring and spare him. And Elizabeth is feeling the same way. She remembers the ring and hopes that he will send it to her as a sign of his renewed devotion. So scene three, we're back at the Great Hall. Elizabeth is mournful about the pending death of her lover, wonders why Sarah is not there to give her comfort. Um, I'm going to skip the, we, we only have a few minutes left. In spite of everything, she wants Robert to live. She still loves him and is waiting for that ring. Finally, Sarah runs in with the ring and confesses that she's Elizabeth's rival. The queen orders the execution stopped, but it is too late. A cannon shot goes off. This is opera. A cannon shot goes off and announces Robert's death. So after Nottingham has arrived, Elizabeth turns on him and Sarah now, where did you get this ring? <laughs> Blood I got. That's what he says. <laughs> 
Okay. So, at this point, you, Elizabeth is furious. She's beside herself. And she sings that spilled blood rises to heaven and then turns to Sarah Nottingham saying, untold tortures await you. So she has them both led away. <laughs> by a vision of the beheaded Robert. She now only longs to be free of her role as queen and longs for her own death. And alone she kisses Robert's ring. She relinquishes the throne. The final scene is one of the most dramatic and difficult in bel canto opera. She's going mad with the death of her lover and it really pushes romantic opera to the limits of melodic expression and makes a very powerful end to one of Donizetti's finest and most affecting operas. The final bars contain six high A's, one high B flat, a high B natural, sometimes interpolated as a D natural. And I'm just going to play the very, very ending for you. <laughs> Donizetti's life, this opera enjoyed a success, a success which enabled him to end the year with a professional triumph. Keep this in mind when you're listening to the opera, the idea of art being a container for very, very intense emotions. We don't have emotions splashing around. They're held in musical form. They're distilled. They're made more intense and communicate more that way. Passion and drama are conveyed in this way. So the performance itself is crucial. Uh, you have to have someone with the emotional conviction and musical accomplishment. So in this, the lead, obviously, uh, is the central character, and Elizabeth is all important. Today, we're going to be hearing Sandra Radvanovsky, who will do a superb job as Elizabeth, and we're in for a real treat this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.